Good morning, AKF. Great to be here on this snowy Colorado Sunday. Today, if you're okay with it, I'd like to talk about science. And everyone should pay attention real quick, this, because we are actually going to, there's actually going to be a quiz at the end. So please pay attention, especially you kids here in front. Pay attention, there will be a quiz at the end. Now, when I tell you what we are going to be discussing today, you're going to immediately think that I'm joking. And I need to state right now that I am not joking. I, I'm actually going to ask you to please take this serious. Here's why. We're all familiar with the golden rule. The golden rule originates in Scripture, and we read in Luke 6.31, And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Many Christians, myself included, believe that God created the universe in six literal days. People that hold this belief, we have been labeled as young earth creationists. Well, something has been happening for many years now. Young earth creationists are being ignored. And they're really not even allowed to enter into the debate anymore. This is undoubtedly a tactical maneuver, right? If the young earth position is given, is not given an opportunity, then hopefully it won't even be able to get off the ground. It's essentially disregarded as something so insane that it's not even worth the time refuting. That's how they're handling young earth creationism. And they won't even debate it anymore. Why? Because that gives our side the opportunity to present arguments that might actually be convincing to people. I don't know about you, but this really bothers me. I can't stand this happening. It seems unfair. All I want is for people to have the opportunity to present their ideas, as crazy as they may sound, and then just let the public decide if they're making a good case or not. To let the facts speak for themselves, as they say. But no, today we live in the middle of a cancel culture where ideas are censored, free speech is inhibited. Oh, and I forgot, this is apparently for our own good. But as we have seen firsthand, as young earth creationists, often this is a tactic utilized to prevent the truth from being presented and possibly accepted by people. Well, the exact same thing that's happening to young earth creationists is happening to another group of people. They too are being ostracized. They're being censored. They're not given the opportunity to present their case. And so in the spirit of the golden rule, especially because we've experienced this type of treatment, I think the least we can do is hear them out. The least we can do is make a concerted effort to actually understand them 
understand what they believe and why they believe it. You likely have only mocked this group of people. You've most likely only made fun of them. And I'm guilty of that as well. But since I have a friend who holds to this position, I decided to go ahead and hear them out. I decided to actually listen and ask questions and do my best to understand them. That's what we want from others, right? So today, we are going to look at the growing body of people who believe that the earth is flat. They refer to themselves as flat earthers. I've spent almost two years now interacting with flat earthers. I've asked countless questions. I've truly worked hard at understanding where they are coming from. Separating the rumors from reality as to what they actually believe and why. And I'm finally at a point where I feel like I understand their position enough to where I can stand up here and accurately represent them without the need to straw man them, straw man them or make fun of them. Now, I discovered something incredibly intriguing on this two-year journey, which I will eventually share. But first, something we need to realize, we all need to realize this, is that many flat earthers, likely most of them, believe the earth is flat because of Scripture. That is why. They desire, like us, to believe in the truth of Scripture wherever that leads. And so they have come to the conclusion that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat and therefore that is why they hold to that truth. So today, we are going to take an honest look at their biblical arguments for a flat earth. We're going to give their position the stage and allow them a chance to present their case. And don't forget that God allowed even the false idols to present their case. This is in Isaiah 41, 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. If we believe that our view on something is true, there's no reason to fear contrary information. No reason at all. Present your case. Bring forth your strong arguments. So with that, let's proceed. To start... I would like to show everyone the thumbnail that we will be uploading to YouTube for this message. Now, as you look at this, I'm actually very proud of this thumbnail as I tried my best to accurately represent visually what flat earthers believe the earth actually looks like. You see, the world mocks flat earthers, by creating images that do not in any way represent their view, represent what they believe. For example, I'm sure you've all seen this one before. Nothing, nothing in this image accurately represents what a flat earther believes about the earth. 
and the rest of the celestial bodies pictured there. First, they don't believe that all celestial bodies are spheres and that it's just the earth that is flat. They don't believe that. Next, they don't believe that the earth is a square. They believe the earth is circular. And then they don't believe that earth is floating in space as pictured here. More on that in a second. And finally, they do not believe that the sun is this large as pictured here many times the size of the earth. Here's one more picture that you've probably seen. And this is a gross misrepresentation of what they actually believe. This picture comes from the Answers in Genesis website. It shows a flat earth in space with water falling off the edge and freezing in the process like a giant icicle. This is not what they believe at all. So, what do they believe? Well, to start, they believe there is a dome that covers the entire earth. One pastor says that this dome is made of crystalline glass. So you can get a visual representation. Now you might be wondering why they think there's a dome up there. And the answer is Scripture. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the first chapter in the Bible. Genesis 1. In verses 6 and 7 of Genesis 1, right after God said, let there be light, we read this. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. The firmament of Genesis 1 has been debated for a long time. I still remember hearing about this as a child, people trying to understand and describe exactly what the firmament was. Now, since it says the firmament divides the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, they conclude that this is referring to a dome above the earth and that above the dome is water. This will come into play more in a minute. Now looking at our picture again, again that I'm very proud of, you will notice that there is water above the dome. Again, I'm trying to accurately represent their view. Now this is one reason they say that the sky is blue. If space is black, then why is the sky blue and not black, or at least a very dark blue? They say one reason the sky is blue is because there is water above the firmament, the dome, above the earth. Now, Christians will argue in response to this that the firmament of Genesis 1 is actually referring to the sky or to the heavens, but the Hebrew word here is rakia. Rakia. And I think all biblical scholars would agree that the Hebrew word rakia is referring to something solid. Solid. Not, not the sky, not an expanse. Now, you can remember this because rakia sounds like rock, which is hard, solid. Now, here's the Wikipedia entry for firmament. It says this, in biblical cosmology, the firmament is the vast solid dome 
created by God during the Genesis creation narrative to divide the primal sea into upper and lower portions so that the dry land could appear. And when we zoom in on the picture there, you can see that there are waters above the firmament. And we read in Psalm 148 that there are waters above the heavens. Verses 3 and 4 tell us this. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise Him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters of above the heavens. I'll touch on this more in a minute, but flat earthers draw our attention to the fact that the Bible only mentions the sun, the moon, and the stars. It does not mention planets. And no space is mentioned either, but rather waters above the heavens. Now, when we get to the flood, we read in Genesis chapter 7 where the waters for the flood came from. Starting in verse 11, we read, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Flat earthers point out that in addition to the fountains of the great deep being broken up, it also says, the windows of heaven were opened and rain came down for 40 days and nights. These windows, they tell us, were windows in the solid dome above the earth, the firmament, which has water above it. So imagine a glass dome, and windows in the glass dome were opened, which allowed the water above it to fall upon the earth over 40 days and nights in order to flood the entire earth. Going back to the creation account of Genesis 1, God makes the sun, the moon, and the stars. Verse 16 of Genesis 1 says, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. This is a very important verse for them. And they draw a couple conclusions here. First, they believe that both the sun and the moon are lights, as it says here. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. Since Scripture says here that both the sun and the moon are lights, flat earthers reject the idea that the moon is a rock. Most of the flat earthers I've interacted with believe that the moon is actually made of plasma. Now, they also point out here and elsewhere, like Psalm 148.3, that the Bible says God created the sun, the moon, and the stars and never mentions planets. So they do not believe that there are other planets. This is one reason that pictures of a flat earth among spherical planets is a misrepresentation of their view. They do not believe God created any planets. Now, the second reason that these pictures misrepresent their view is they do not believe in space, sometimes referred to as outer space. They don't believe in space. Since it's water that's above the firmament, that dome above the earth, there is no outer space. The stars that we see in the night sky, those are actually on the firmament itself. They're on the dome, they're not above it. 
and the sun and the moon are below the dome. Okay, here's one graphical representation of their view. As you look at this, you'll notice that it's the sun and the moon that are moving, not the earth. And I should point out that flat earthers believe the sun and the moon are the same size. And that's why you see them as the same size in their models. Now, they also do not believe the earth is spinning. Why? Again, they say because of the Bible. Now, they'll first point out to you that you cannot feel any movement. They'll point out to you you cannot see any movement. And then right after that, they're going to show you these verses in Scripture. Let's start with 1 Chronicles 16.30, which says, Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Since this says the earth shall not be moved, they argue that not only is the earth not spinning, by the way, at 1,000 miles per hour around its axis, but they also argue that the earth is not traveling around the sun at an additional 67,000 miles per hour. Then there's Psalm 93.1, where we read, The Lord reigns, He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed, He has girded Himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Again, the Bible describes the earth as something that cannot be moved, yet globe science says it is constantly moving, and it will never stop moving. And so if the earth is not spinning and floating in space, you may want to know from a flat earther what the earth is sitting on. Fair question. They will show you verses like Psalm 75.3. Psalm 75.3 says, The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. Flat earthers tell us that the earth is not floating in space, but it was actually set up by God on pillars as its firm foundation. And then we have 1 Samuel 2.8, which says, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He has set the world upon them. The earth has pillars, which God has set the world upon. And this is echoed in Psalm 104. Verse 5 of Psalm 104 reads, You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. Again, God put the earth on a foundation that will never be moved. And they point out that the flying, spinning ball model of the globe is the exact opposite of what is portrayed in the Bible, which is an earth that never moves. Now, while we're on the topic of the earth not moving, and instead the sun and the moon moving in the sky underneath the firmament, let's turn to Joshua chapter 10. In Joshua 10, God does an incredible miracle. Let's read about it, starting with verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. 
you will notice here that it says the sun stood still. It says the moon stopped. It does not say that the earth stopped spinning. So the flat earthers claim that this makes the most sense in their model, which we just looked at with the sun and the moon spinning above the earth, that this miracle in Joshua 10 was God stopping the sun and the moon for about a day. Now there are places in the Bible where the earth is referred to as God's footstool. For example, Isaiah 66, 1, which says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? There's also Matthew 5, 35. It says, Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And so flat earthers remind us that a footstool does not paint a picture in our mind of a ball. You do not think of a ball when you hear the word footstool. Rather, you envision something like this. Something flat. Something circular. Something on four legs which look a lot like pillars. Let's look at one more group of verses. And these are the verses which mention the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. First is Job 28, 24. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens. Flat earthers point out that on a sphere, there are no ends. None. There's no ends whatsoever on a ball. A sphere or a ball is simply round, but no ends. And on their model, the edge represents the end of the earth. And again, people mock flat earthers by asking, oh, can you fall off the edge? But this shows a misunderstanding of their view. They believe there is a dome encasing the entire earth. So there would be no way to fall off. Next is Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. God created the ends of the earth. In their view, God created the edge. And one more in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Again, a sphere has no end on it anywhere. Now, at this point, you might be racking your brain trying to think of anywhere in Scripture where it describes the earth as a sphere. And you might be remembering one verse that you've heard of in the past, which refers to the circle of the earth. That is in Isaiah chapter 40. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 40, and we're going to look at verse 22. Here we read, it is he, referring to God, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. I was taught growing up that this verse teaches that the earth is a sphere and not flat. But if you look carefully, this says the circle of the earth. And so flat earthers actually claim this verse as evidence of their view. They will show you that their model is flat, but also a circular earth, a circle. 
they also point out that this verse says God stretched out the heavens like a curtain and spread them out like a tent to dwell in. And they believe that this is referring to the firmament, the dome that they believe is above us. Now, if we envision a tent on the ground, what does that look like? Well, it looks very similar to a dome on a flat plain. That's what a tent looks like. And again, this verse says that the heavens are like a tent to dwell in, something over our head that we live underneath. And again, they believe the sun and the moon are underneath the firmament, underneath the dome. And they point us to Psalm 19, which they say explicitly states this. Psalm 19 verse 4 says, Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. A tabernacle or a tent for the sun, being the firmament above the earth. Let's finish with one more verse. This one is probably the verse that they most often use, actually, at least in my experience. This one comes from Job chapter 38, and we will read verse 14. It takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. Flat earthers tell us that this verse is talking about the earth and they bring our attention to exactly what form clay takes under a seal. Well, as you look at this picture, what do you, what do you notice? Well, it's flat. The center has the image protruding up from the flat surface and it's surrounded by a border all around. This image is exactly how they view the world. A flat earth, land masses coming up out of the water in the center, and everything surrounded by a circular ice wall border. So we have a situation here where a growing group of people who have a desire to find the truth and a desire to defend Scripture, they see the Bible as teaching a flat earth. And so this prompts a valid question. Does the Bible teach a flat earth? I mentioned at the beginning that there will be a quiz at the end. And the quiz is this. This week, I want you to tell me your response to their position. I want you to tell me how you understand their verses. And then I will give you my answer to the question, does the Bible teach a flat earth next week in part two? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just come to you today and... We're reminded right now with this discussion that creation is your creation, and we're reminded that you created the world and the universe and everything in it. We've got people who disagree with one another, but both have a common desire, which is to understand exactly what it is you've created, understand how it works, and to use your word, the Bible, to help us in that understanding. And I pray that you just give all of us wisdom as we look at this, to understand exactly what you've done, how that represents you and your design, and how we are to understand what we find in the pages of the Bible. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.